this video is going to focus on exponential functions and we're going to go into um, how to graph them and also how to determine the equations in them given certain points. Let's uh, first look at what an exponential function should look like when we write the equation. This here is your form, y is equal to a times r to the x. A represents your y-intercept, and the way you would get that is pretty easy, actually. If uh, you were to plug in 0 for x right there, that would make r to the 0, which is 1, and that would only leave you with a. r is the rate in which an exponential function is growing or decaying. Essentially, your graphs are going to look like one of two. Either the one on the left, in which it is going upwards, and then the one on the right, which is essentially the opposite. You're starting from up on high and then leveling off. Both graphs have an asymptote, and you might see it across the bottom here. It's very faint. Uh, same thing here. And what that signifies essentially is that the graphs, as this one approaches uh, infinity for x, the graph is getting closer and closer to zero, but it's never going to get there. Here, same thing, but in the reverse direction. Now, if it is going upwards like this, we say that it is growing, and the other one would be if it were decaying. An exponential function would be growing if your rate is larger than 1. So, whenever this rate uh, gets above 1, and by the way, it'll never be 1, it'll either be more than 1 or less than 1, then we know that this thing is, is going to keep going up. Um, decaying if it's less than 1, and I put absolute value here to signify that if uh, you are given a rate, it'll never be negative. In fact, it'll never even be 0. So we get fractions or we get numbers larger than 1, but that's essentially it. Take this one, for instance. Let's say you were to graph f of x is equal to 2 times 3 to the x. Which of these two graphs would best represent it? The one here on the left, or the one on the right? Well, note that the rate is 3. And since the rate 3 is larger than 1, that means that this thing is growing. So it's going to be this graph here on the left. Since 2 is the y-intercept, that means we'll have a point crossing here. And that also means that each subsequent point triples. That's what the rate simply represents. So the next one over is 1, 6, because 3 times 2 is 6. After that, it's 18, because 3 times 6 is 18. So you can guess that when we get to the next point over, which should be way up here somewhere, if you triple 18, 54, you can see that this thing really takes off in a hurry. What if this was your equation and you were asked to graph? Well, note that the rate is 1 fourth. And by the way, I'm hoping that you're getting that the rate is not necessarily the second value, but rather the value that has x for an exponent. So whatever the base is for that variable, that's your rate. So our rate here is 1 fourth, which means that it's decaying. So it's going to be this graph here on the right. That means that the y-intercept 8 is where it crosses, and that as you progress, each and every subsequent point is 1 fourth of the previous y-value. So if you had 8 here, 1 fourth of 8 is 2, so that would be the next y-value, and that, of course, is much lower. And then 1 fourth of 2 is 1 half. If you're going backwards, you have to think, well, one-fourth of what number gives you 8? And that would be the same thing as doing the reverse, which is timesing by 4. And that's really it. That's the quick and easy way of determining these graphs. Let's do another, only this time with some translations. Let's say you're given f of x is equal to 2 to the power of x minus 3, then plus 1. Now, what we need to keep in mind is that this is going to be some kind of exponential graph that's been shifted over. So let's worry about what this looks like before we shift it. In other words, look at f of x is equal 2 to the x, and let's not worry about that one right now. So let's get our basic information here. The rate is 2 because this number here is the base for the exponent x. 
And if you're wondering, well, then what's the y-intercept got to be? Well, it's 1. It's just not written in in this case. So we know that we're going to get something crossing right there. And since the rate is 2, that means it doubles each time. So since it's at 1, you double 1 and you get 2. And if you double 2, you get 4. And if you double 4, you get 8. And if you double 8, you get 16. And so on and so forth. So you see, that's what you're looking at. And keep in mind, asymptote going across the axis. OK, so that's what it would look like without all the translation. Now, let's consider it with the translation. Since you have this exponent here, whatever is with x, essentially is going to tell us which way this thing is going to shift. Take this value and set it equal to 0. And when you solve for x, you get 3. That's positive 3 units in that we will be shifting this graph. And that's to the right since we're talking x here. For the vertical shift, whatever number is out here basically tells us what you see is what you get. It says plus 1. That means you're going to move it up 1 unit. So let's go ahead and do that with our graph. Move it over 1, 2, 3 units, and then up 1 unit. And you'll notice that when we do this, the asymptote follows. So in reality, in reality, the asymptote did shift over horizontally, but that doesn't do anything to it. But what essentially does is that it moves it up. So whatever this vertical shift is here, that basically tells us where the asymptote is going to cross. In any case, note that you can do the whole graph like we did, or just go point to point. This point moved over 3 and up 1. This point moved over 3 and up 1. And even this point moved over 3 and up 1. They all do that. So if you know the points of the original graph, you can just simply count towards the new graph. OK, now let's consider this one. This one's a bit different. You'll notice at the rate, 1 third is a decaying graph. So already we should have an expectation of what this looks like. Let's worry about what this thing would look like without all this adding and subtracting going on. So basically 9 times 1 third to the x. And if you're wondering, how do I know just to zero in on that, just remember it's all about the intercept and the rate and then x. So that's all I'm writing. The intercept is 9, so have a point up at 9. And then each and every subsequent point, you're taking 1 third of the previous value. So 1 third of 9 is 3. 1 third of 3 is 1. 1 third of 1 is 1 third. And if you do this and map it out correctly, we should get something that looks like this. OK, now let's worry about everything else. Notice that right here in front of x, there's a negative sign. Because we have a negative in front of that variable, this tells us that we've got a reflection. We've got a reflection if one of two conditions are met, the negative in front of x or a negative in front of the whole entire statement. So in front of x, this typifies that we're going to get a reflection in the horizontal direction because x is a horizontal variable. Since we know we're going to have to shift this as well because we have some adding going on and some subtracting, try to do another graph just with the reflection and then translate. So just with the reflection, we know we've got to flip this horizontally. So let's take the graph and do that. And there we are. <clears throat> from, a, from a practical standpoint, essentially what you're doing is whatever x values you had, you just simply change the sign. So like you see this point here, this point is located at 2 comma 1. So what you do is you graph negative 2 comma 1. This point is located at 1 comma 3. So what you do is you graph negative 1 comma 3. That's the way that goes. So that helps you achieve your reflection. And if you're wondering again why, negative in front of the x. So that tips you off. Now let's worry about the translation. This part here indicates the horizontal change. So let's take this part here and let's set it to 0. Do that and we get 2, which means we're going to have to move this thing 2 units to the right. 
And again, remember that whatever value is out here tells you your vertical shift, and what you see is what you get. So this is going to be down one unit. Go ahead and take your graph and do that. That is, we're going to move it two units to the right, and then one unit down. And note again that the asymptote kind of goes with it. So since our vertical shift is down one unit, our asymptote crosses at negative one. And that's all there is to it. Okay, for this last one, we won't have to graph this time. What you're going to ask to do is to determine the equation. You can do a graph if you wish, if that helps you picture it, but it's really unnecessary. Keep in mind that since they tell us that it's an exponential equation, we know that our formula is going to look like this in the very end. Also note that they're giving us a couple points here. We have 118, because x is 1, and y is 18. And we also have 3, 2. Now, here's the strategy for something like this. Whenever you're given a problem where you must determine values for an equation, in this case, a and r, what you need to do is you take the points that they give you and you plug them in. There's the first one. 18 is for y, and then x is for 1. So that's what you're seeing there. Do the same thing for 3, 2 and uh, we get that. Okay, so here's the deal. What you have here is two equations, and we also happen to have two variables. Because we have two equations and two variables, what we can do is we can take this thing and we can solve this system, because that's what we have, and you'll want to use substitution here, not elimination. It is tempting for a lot of students to try elimination, like to subtract like this and do this, and thinking that the a's cancel. But since these are multiplied together, you can't do that. It would have to be a plus r and then a plus r cubed. So unfortunately, it's going to have to be substitution. Let's take this first equation and let's solve for one of the two variables. How about we solve for a? That means dividing out r so that the r's reduce out. And what we're left with is this. Okay, now let's look at that second equation. Let's take that second one and let's take uh, our last answer and let's plug that in here for a. So if we substitute that in, we get this. And you'll notice that the r's here are going to reduce. So we have one r here, and then three of these now become just two of them. So let's divide 18. And then what we'll do is we'll square root. So remember that when you square root like this, a square root of a fraction is going to give you the square root of the top and then the square root of the bottom. So that's 1 over 3. OK, we're almost done. Now let's go back to the first equation where we had our answer for a. Let's take our answer for r, and let's substitute it right in there. OK, we need some room here. So how about we take this and move this aside over here? So substituting that in, and this is what we get. And remember that you have a, essentially a division problem whenever there's a fraction. You're taking the top value, 18, and you're dividing by one-third, which is the same thing as taking 18 and multiplying by the reciprocal. So that gives us 54 for a, and then now we can finish this up. Since these are our solutions, let's go ahead and replace them into a and into r. And right there is our answer, and we're all done. That's it for this one. I'll see you next time.